Someone sent me that this morning and I thought it was pretty good. So, um, yeah, we're going to uh, meet and we're going to listen to John talk about John because we're on a John series. So it's a John morning. And then um, uh, after that, we're going to uh, break and have a worship uh, communion service together there. So that, that's the plan this morning. And hallelujah. Why don't I pray? Thank you, Father God, um, for the privilege of meeting here together this morning. Thank you for the freedom to do so and uh, the blessing, Lord. And we want to stand in all of your goodness today and all of your provision for us, uh, meeting together as one body to worship you, to give you glory. Lord, it's our heart's desire, Lord, that you be glorified and that you be glorified in us. So um, bless us today. Um, as we meet you and um, yeah bless our time together in Jesus precious name amen okay I'll hand over to Cheryl thanks Cheryl morning Um, the computer is doing an update or something so we'll be using our books uh, for the first song that's so we will be doing there is a redeemer that's 673 Should we just... It's 673, there is a redeemer.
Sunday school. Thank you, Father God, um, for the Sunday school, and I pray, Lord, that you would bless uh, the lessons this morning for these kids, and thank you for the blessing of children, Lord, and once again for the freedom and the privilege of putting um, lots of good things about you into their hearts. So bless the teachers this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. sent his son um, from the book again that's 52 
that was rousing. Okay. I was just sitting there having this mental vision of repeating that final chorus till 12 o'clock, waiting for the computer to finish its memorization thing. Anyway, we don't have to do that. I'm just going to pray for John, and um, John will bring his word. Thank you, Father God, for uh, this man and his heart for you. And I pray, Lord God, that you will uh, help us to hear, not just with our ears, but with our hearts, Lord, what you have uh, for us today through him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Thanks. Well, good morning. So this is on, is it? Or is that this one? That's probably that one. Okay. We just have a wee technical area. So um, will this work? Yep, so everything should go now. Oh, look at that. So we're double speaking. The microphone will go down. And always pays to have a backup plan. So I... Um, when I have a PowerPoint, I actually bring my laptop as a backup plan. So if the computer's almost with us after spending the last 20 minutes doing the Windows update, um, but I can start because I have my laptop, so we'll do that. Um, and when um, the computer's fully on, we'll catch up on the screen behind so you can follow. So um, we're in John 10 second half of John 10 on our series on John. And in the second half of John 10, Jesus is presented as the good shepherd, as the Messiah, and as God's son. And so we're going to unpack a little bit about what the second half of John 10 says about that. So you'll need your Bibles so you can follow along because we're going to start by reading the second half of John chapter 10. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts, walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him said, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. They're changing computers. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are God's? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart 
as his very own and sent into the world. Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. So we're in the second half of John 10, and there's two sections we're going to look at. Um, I am the good shepherd, and I want to think about two aspects of this. The first is, my sheep hear my voice. And the second is being held securely in the shepherd's hands. And then we want to look at the theme of Jesus as Messiah and God's Son, which is confirmed by what he says, confirmed by the scriptures, and confirmed by what he does. So, We'll review a little bit of last week and continue on on the theme of Jesus, the Good Shepherd. And in this chapter, we see some things about the shepherd and some things about the sheep. And so we see uh, that the shepherd calls the sheep by name and that the sheep listen to the voice of the shepherd. And so... We have to put ourselves in the Middle East here. We're not on a New Zealand farm where the sheep are all fenced in a paddock. But we're in the Middle East where the sheep are kept in a pen overnight, which is sort of walled off by stone, a stone wall and there's an entrance. And in the day, the shepherd leads them out and they go into the open lands where the food is, but where there's also potential danger. And the shepherd goes everywhere with the sheep, and the sheep follow the shepherd. And so we see the shepherd calls his sheep by name, and they listen to his voice. And then we see that he leads them out, and that they follow the shepherd. And we see that the shepherd knows the sheep, he can call them by name, and that the sheep know the shepherd. They recognize the shepherd's voice. And then we see remarkably that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So I want to think a little bit about hearing the voice of the shepherd. So here's a couple of verses in the first part of the chapter. I am the gates. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. And earlier in the chapter, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And then in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then we get to verse 26 and 27. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. The sheep listen to, 
they recognise the voice of the shepherd and they follow the shepherd. They obey the shepherd because they know the shepherd. They trust the voice of the shepherd. They have experienced something of the goodness of the shepherd. They know and trust the shepherd. And so we see the sheep follow the shepherd because his voice is known to them and they trust it. So I want to start, we'll have a couple of thoughts about hearing the voice of the shepherd. And I think if you have seen what Jesus has done for you, and you've thought about it, and your heart has been moved by what Jesus has done for you, then you have heard the voice of the shepherd. In your heart, in your soul, God has called you and you have heard his voice. You have listened, you have begun to recognise, and there's a call to follow, and as you sense what God has done for you in your heart, you are beginning to know and trust him. You have entered through the gate. You have entered through Jesus into the sheep pen, and you have heard his voice. But you know, there's also the challenge of listening for his voice. The sheep listen to the voice of the shepherd. And uh, if you're in the forest and it's the morning or the evening, there's all sorts of voices and songs going on. And with so many competing voices, how do you hear the voice that you need to hear? You know, there's so many different species of birds. How do they hear the right one? It's just everything's going everywhere. So how do we hear God's voice? I think there's a number of ways we hear God's voice, but one is through our conscience. God speaks to our conscience, and it's important to not harden our conscience so we can hear God speak to us in our conscience. And God speaks to us through his word. As we read his word, the Spirit picks up the word and convinces us or convicts us of something and brings us back to it. But also, we hear God's word by recognizing and responding to the voice of the shepherd. There's a familiarity of hearing and trusting the voice of the shepherd. And God wants to speak to us as the good shepherd and to lead us. And there's a familiarity about hearing and trusting his voice. And so I think these are some of the things when it comes to hearing God's voice. He's calling us. He's protecting us. He wants to lead us into good pasture. Are we familiar with his voice? Are we tuning in? Are we hearing his voice above the competing voices in our society? My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Let's reflect now for a few minutes on security, on what level of protection do we need? The good shepherd protected his sheep. So I think we protect and we make secure the things that are important to us. So in society, there's a lot of security around this, around your money. And, you know, there's some wonderful banks with incredible security systems. 
So how secure is your money? And uh, in a university setting, you may be thinking a bit more about this. How secure is your career? And you're working and you're studying and you're trying to lock it in. How secure is your career? I think God has a more interesting question for us. How secure is your life? And the good shepherd is very interested in this question. And this is what he says. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And so we see that the good shepherd gives us eternal life. John's gospel really emphasizes the theme of eternal life. And there's seven passages in John's gospel where Jesus talks about giving us eternal life or being the resurrection and the life. It's all through the book. And we see that Jesus is the source, he's the way, he's the gate into eternal life. And this life is eternal in duration, it's everlasting. It's eternal in nature. It's primarily a spiritual life. And it's eternal in character. It is the life of Christ in us. Jesus in us. The Holy Spirit in us. And Jesus describes it as being filled with living water. The shepherd gives us eternal life. But it goes on to say that they shall never perish. The emphasis is on the word never. If the shepherd gives us eternal life, we are protected. We will never perish. And it says no one, there's no power that can snatch us out of his hands. We are held in the arms of the shepherd. We are held in the hands of the one who created the universe. And there is no one who can snatch us out of his hand. But perhaps that's not enough. Perhaps we need some double security. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. I think we see here first that the sheep are precious. The Father has given the sheep to the Son. Both the Father and the Son care for the sheep. And then as we are told that no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. My Father is greater than all. And I think we're automatically almost being drawn back to Romans 8, where we're told, if God is for us, who can be against us? Double security. Held in the Son's hands, held in the Father's hands. So is there any place where we could be more secure? I think the emphasis around security here is in the context of eternal life. I have given them eternal life and no one will snatch them out of my hands. We haven't been promised that physical, bad physical things will not happen to us. That's not what God's promising us. 
but he has promised as the shepherd to guide and protect us and guarantees eternal life. And there's no place that is safer than being in God's hands and walking by God's plans. We can trust the voice of the shepherd. And so we are doubly protected, being held in the hands of the Son and the Father who are united and one in purpose and power when it comes to protecting the sheep. So we've thought a little bit about the good shepherd, hearing his voice and being held in his hand. So let's come back to the theme of Jesus, the Messiah, and God's Son. And this brings us to the setting of where we are in the chapter. It's the Feast of Dedication. So um, this is the feast commemorating when the Maccabean revolt, uh, the uprising took place, and they kicked the Seleucids out of the country and the temple had been, well, uh, contaminated is not the word, it had been, well, desecrated, that's probably about the right word. And they rededicated the temple. And so this is a feast to commemorate the rededication of the temple. And the setting, I think, is that there's a number of people in Jerusalem and they're talking about this man, Jesus. And Jesus isn't there. And they're waiting for the next feast, for Jesus to come up so they can quiz him. And they want to see him perform some miracles and prove that he's Messiah and sort it out. Because the leaders don't seem to be sort of going along with this. And so there's this sort of controversy and they're waiting for Jesus to come and he comes to the temple and he's in the colonnade around the temple and they corner him. How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. And I think here there's an issue of Something we experience, actually, a bit in our lives is you're talking to someone about something or they're talking to you about something and you make it really clear. And a few days later, you find out that they don't seem to have understood what you said to them or you haven't understood what they said to you. And there's this issue of different perspectives. And... When you say this, and when they say the same thing, you actually mean something slightly different. And you're sort of talking at cross purposes, um, and it just doesn't quite gel. I, I'm sure most of you have experienced this. And, and this is the situation here. The Jews are thinking about Jesus as the Messiah the one who will come and sit on David's throne and will kick the Romans out and will bring in the glorious kingdom that's been prophesied about. But Jesus, well, yes, he understands that. He embraces that. But for him being the Messiah is much, much more. He is God's son. And he's been sent on a mission to save the people from their sins and to give them eternal life. And when he says he's the Messiah and he's God's son, he's got a much greater mission in mind than what the Jewish leaders and people have. And so there's sort of this talking at cross purposes. And so Jesus answers the questions by identifying the problem by clearly stating what it means for him to be the Messiah and to a presenting three evidences which show why he is both the Messiah and God's son. Hmm. 
So Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. So here we are. I did tell you. I've actually already pretty clearly answered this question for you. But there's a problem. The problem is not that I haven't been clear. The problem is that you don't believe what I'm really trying to tell you. And not only have I told you, but I've also shown you my actions, the works I do in my Father's name, they testify about me. And this is the diagnosis. You do not believe because you are not my sheep. So here's evidence one, the words of Jesus. I did tell you. What had he told them? I mean, the claims that he had been making are breathtaking. They're either incredible or insane. Here we are. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. Man, he's been claiming some pretty incredible things. How about this? Whoever believes in me shall not perish, but have eternal life. And we're told in John 5, for this reason they tried all the more to kill him, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. He had been telling them, and they'd heard it. But just in case you don't understand, let me really emphasize it again. Let me tell you about the sheep and the Father, and the Son. I give them eternal life. That's a pretty big claim. And they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. Who is this chap claiming to be? My Father has given them to me, and he is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. This chap, he's claiming that God's his Father. And I and the Father are one. I don't think there's any question that he's claiming something pretty significant here. I and the Father are one. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he was with God in the beginning. Wow, there we are. Jesus is claiming to be one with God. They are one in their essence and their nature. They share the same character. They have one purpose and they share the same power they live in perfect community with one another. So although at one level they're separate, at another level they are the same, completely inseparable. The one God, Al, is described as a plural God, Elohim. And in exactly the same way, in John 10, Jesus and the Father are one. So what's the response? Again, his Jewish opponents pick up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, 
because you, a mere man, claim to be God. His claim was clear. It was consistent. And in John 10, it's emphasized. He wants them to know what he means when he says that he is God's son and the Messiah. And it's so clear that the people think there's only one response for this. This mere man, this flesh and bone who claims to be God, he needs to be stoned. The claim is clear. So is it true or is it not? Is he Lord? Is he a liar? Is he a lunatic? If it's true, it's the most incredible claim of the universe. This one is Lord. If it's false, and he knows it's false, then he is a lying deceiver who is trying to lead people astray. And he doesn't do it once, he does it time and time again. And if it's false, and he doesn't know that it's false, i.e. he's deceived himself, then he's crazy, he's deceived. Maybe he's hearing voices. He's a lunatic. Lord, liar, lunatic. But there's one option he doesn't leave open for us, that he's a good moral teacher. If it's false, he's a liar. He's not good. He's deceiving the people. He's not moral. Lord, liar, or lunatic. Well, the Jews had a pretty clear verdict on this. They decided he was a lunatic. The claim was ridiculous. He had to be mad. But there was a problem. What about the beauty of the words he spoke? And what about the power of his miracles? How did he do that? Well, the only way he could do that, the only way he could cast out demons was he did it through the power of demons. And so in John 10, they said, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? And in John 8, they said, aren't we right in saying that you were demon-possessed? And in the other Gospels, we see that the teachers of the law came um, down from Jerusalem and said, by the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. But that's not the end of the story. Because there's two other evidences, not just what Jesus says, but what the scriptures say and what Jesus does. So Jesus answered them. So the got the stones in their hands, they're ready to go. And Jesus answers them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set aside as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. So, this is a bit of an obscure passage and a bit of an obscure argument from our perspective. Jesus quotes from Psalm 82. And he's saying, before you conclude that I'm blaspheming, you need to think about what the scriptures say, what the scriptures that you claim to believe in say. And in the psalm, God is acting as a judge over the rulers or the judges of the people. And these rulers, well, they weren't doing too well. But in the psalm, three times they are called gods, or in the very most generic uh, sense of the word, mighty ones. 
So here's a couple of examples. The gods know nothing. They understand nothing. They were doing the wrong things. I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. But you will die like more mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. So it's an it's a interesting passage to pull out. That Jesus is using a form of argument that was well understood by the Pharisees. Arguing from the lesser to the greater. So let me take you through it. If the lesser is true, and the scripture cannot be set aside, and the greater is also true, then this is the implication. So if the rulers in the passage in Psalm, who were representing God and who had received the voice of God, even though they were doing such a bad job, were called gods, and they were, and if the scripture cannot be set aside, and it can't, then think about this greater truth. Surely the one who has been uniquely set aside by God from the beginning of time, and surely this one who has been sent into the world for the special task, surely this one should be called God's son. Consider the great task he's been selected to and the great task he's been sent to do. If the judges could be called God's, surely this one who has been specially selected and sent by God should also be called God's son. And this is the implication. As I am this one, when I say I am God's son, you should not accuse me of blasphemy. So that's how the argument goes. So you're sort of thinking, man, this person, how can he be God? And you get this sort of scriptural reasoning from you know, this is something that you believe in these scriptures. I mean, what do you do? How do you deal with it? Well, you can either stop and think carefully about what the scripture says, or you can continue confident that your prejudgment of the situation is right. I just want to detour just for a couple of hours for a minute and think about Jesus and the scripture. Jesus treated the scriptures with total respect as the very word of God. He quoted them when he was being tempted. He taught them to the people. He quotes it to the Jewish leaders when they're trying to stone him. He acknowledges that not a letter or a stroke of a pen will pass away. And it's his respect of the scripture that enables him to use this passage in this context. What about the scripture and me? Do I treat the scripture with respect as God's word which cannot be set aside? Do I allow God to speak to me through his word? Do I hear the voice of the shepherd through his word? Or when I get to the difficult passages in scripture and the difficult sayings of Jesus, mm, do I try and ignore them or explain them away? Now, sometimes when we study the really difficult things and passages, that we discover things about God and ourselves which will lead to our growth. So let's put it another way. Once I've studied the scripture, correctly understood it in its context, 
applied what it says to my situation, maybe I don't like what it says. Do I accept that it has authority over me, that the scriptures cannot be set aside? Or do I use some good-sounding argument to dismiss it and explain it away? I think a good-sounding argument where I end up deciding what part of the Scripture is right and what part of the Scripture is wrong is an example of setting the Scripture aside. Do I judge the scriptures or do I let the scriptures judge me? So one of the reasons in this church that we preach the word of God consistently is that we believe that the scriptures cannot be set aside and we need to treat them with the respect that Jesus did. Let's move to the last evidence that Jesus presents. Evidence three, he's doing the work of the Father. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, even though you don't believe what I say, believe the works that you may know and understand the Father is in me and I in the Father. And they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. So here Jesus is referring to the principle that you can tell a tree by its fruit. If you see me do the works of my Father, then you know I am from the Father. If you don't believe what I say, if you see what I do and believe what I do, then you may begin to understand who I really am. So, how had Jesus done the works of God the Father? He'd been sent by the Father. He'd lived a sinless life in obedience to the Father. He had shown the compassion and the grace of the Father. He had taught God's truth. He had cast out demons, showing that the kingdom of God was coming. He had performed miracles that only the Messiah was meant to be able to do. He had fed the 5,000. He had made the waves stand still. So even if you don't believe what I say, look at what I've done, and then you may begin to understand who I am that you may know that the Father is in me. You may know, you may be sure in your heart and understand, believe or have faith that the Father is in me. The works that Jesus did were in obedience to the Father. It was his delight to do the works of the Father. It was in his nature to do the works of the Father. It is through the power of the Father that he does the works of the Father. And when you see what Jesus did, the life of the Father flows through him. And you see that the Father is in the Son. But when you see his works, you also know that the Son is in the Father. When you think about the plan of salvation, the resurrection, the Son's mastery over creation, his words of grace and truth, it shows that the Father and the Son live together in perfect community. It confirms that the Son is in the Father. It reveals to us what the Father is like and demonstrates that they are one. So they ask the question, 
how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Well, he's answered their question pretty clearly and plainly. So how do they respond? They respond with rejection. They wanted to stone him. They don't listen to the testimony of Scripture or of the testimony of his works. They become more entrenched in their position. And their actions confirm what Jesus has told them, that they are not his sheep. And what's the response of Jesus? He leaves them alone. And this is one of the tragedies that can happen to someone. If you push Jesus away and he leaves you alone, that in itself is a judgment. We need God to be calling us and bringing us to himself. But it's also completely just. If you want nothing to do with God and God withdraws himself to you, he's only doing what you've asked him to do. It is a judgment and completely just. And he moves to another place, to the Jordan, where John baptized to present the truth to those who will believe. And sometimes you need to move on and to present the truth to people who want to hear it. So we're going to skip through this and come to the summary. So we have thought in John 10 about Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Are you listening to the voice of the Good Shepherd? Have you heard his voice? Do you recognize his voice? Do you follow his voice? And we have reflected about how we are held securely in the shepherd's hands. How nothing can take the eternal life that he gives us away from us. And we've reflected on Jesus, the divine Messiah. The one who is one with the Father. Have you examined his claims? Have you studied the scriptures which point towards him? Have you understood his divine works which confirm that he is in the Father and the Father is in him? But let's finish with this verse. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning that each and every one of us may know your voice. Father, we pray that you will speak into our lives, and we will recognize your voice as you draw us to you. And we pray also that as we live our life, that we will continue to recognize your voice. And as you call and go out, that we will follow the shepherd, the good shepherd who has done so much for us. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your care. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for your compassion. Help us to experience and live in the light of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll just take a break for five or so minutes now and we'll pick up again so stretch your legs
Righto, we'll get underway again. I'll hand it over to I'll hand it over to Cheryl. Please join us as we um, sing Will Your Anchor Hold in the Storms of Life? Number seven seven zero. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life?
Thank you. Thank you, musicians. So we're going to just change tack now and move into uh, worship time. And so if the Lord has put something on your heart, this is a time for the brothers to come up and share. And um, I'll just, where's he gone? Thank you, John, for that message. And it, it um, yeah, it just reminds me of quite a bit. It, it, I remember as a young fella, I really actually struggled with the word to just to understand it. And I remember praying, Lord, I don't get, I don't get this book, and just asking the Lord to help me understand the Bible. And that was a long time ago. Well, it felt like it feels like a long time to me. Might not be long for some of you, but it, it was, it was. Um, just the start of something good and the Lord has really shown me time and time again the truth of that word in John 10 where it says that the scripture cannot be broken or the translation John used was cannot be set aside so um, just about every wrong thing and heresy you can think up with is when people put themselves over the scripture as opposed to under the scripture, which is where we belong. So that it was really good to hear that. And, you know, it's massively missing in so many churches, just that basic idea that actually the Bible tells us what to think. We don't tell the Bible what to think. And so it's really great to um, hear that affirmed here uh, in this little body here. Um, so... Yeah, I'm really grateful for that and that, that we hold to that and that we believe that. Um, anyway, so I thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that it's preached clearly and um, we want to remember now uh, just the sacrifice of, of your life, the cross that stands before us and uh, everything comes, every, every good thing comes out of that. And it, it pretty much uh, is a testimony to the truth of your word uh, spoken in the past. And I thank you for that and for that testimony we have. Help us now as we fix our hearts and our minds on you, Lord, to worship you. Amen.
many of you have been <coughs> associated with a farm, a sheep farm in particular, either your uncles or been on one or that? <coughs> Some of you? Yes? Okay, there's quite a few of you. Um, <coughs> in New Zealand, I mean, you know, we're a country of sheep farms. I mean, the Good Shepherd, all this stuff about listening to the voice. Yeah. Does it make sense? Quietly, does it really? Always. Um, I'm, I've been privileged. I mean, I'm, <clears throat> my father-in-law is a sheep farmer uh, out on the Tauri. He was. He's now in a rest home, of course. But he's all his life he worked with sheep. And one of the problems we have in New Zealand is that we seem to think we know a lot about sheep, when in fact we deal with them so differently. And John pointed out some of the things that the in the Middle East that happens with sheep that we just don't see. But my father-in-law was able to do, show some of these characteristics of sheep. I mean, I don't know how you feel about being compared to a sheep. You kind of see them as silly and, you know, they do stupid things at times. But the one thing we've heard about this morning, and I think that, uh, I think, I saw my father-in-law demonstrate this so beautifully. In John 10, it talks there in the end of verse 3, the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow them because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Now, most of our sheep move because there's a dog on their tail. And we drive sheep in New Zealand. We fence them and we drive them through that gate. That's how we get them to do the things we want. But my father-in-law demonstrated very beautifully one day. We were out in the paddock with a group of other people, and he said to them, see those sheep over there? Here's some really good grass and material. You get them to come. And we sat there, and we waved the grass and this. It was much better than what they had, and they didn't do a thing. They wouldn't move. And then he, here, yeah, OK. <laughs> And then just a moment later, he says, watch this. And he just said, come, 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 come. And they all just, Pow! just came. And we just sat there astounded. I mean, I thought sheep were nuts, you know, stupid creatures. But they knew the shepherd's voice. Do you know the shepherd's voice? They knew instinctively. We tried, we did everything, we yelled, you know, we, and it just wouldn't work. But he just said these few words, and they all came running to the fence right up to us because they knew he was the shepherd and he was the one that was looking after them. Now, we don't see that. That was a, a seen a lot in the Middle East. And, of course, the other thing is that he leads them, it says in this passage. But then the other thing that impressed me about this little part here, <clears throat> he goes on ahead of them, the sheep follow him, because they know his voice, and that's true of even New Zealand sheep. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run from him because they do not recognise a stranger's voice. And sadly, we as sheep, we all go astray, we have turned everyone to our own way. And we don't listen to the voice of our God. And the problem is often that we are listening to other voices. What voices have you been listening to this week? What voices that are a stranger's voice that we tend to wander off so easily Oh yes, there's that little voice in the corner in the box in the corner of the living room. 
there are other things we're reading and listening to that we know that it's not the shepherd's voice. I just pray that God will help us to listen to his voice, to follow him, because that's what he, he wants us to hear him and to follow his voice. And I'm reminded in Hebrews, the end of Hebrews, and the benediction it gives there, it talks there about our great shepherd. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and that he may work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. And this morning... We're remembering the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, the fact that he gave himself for the sheep. But we're also remembering that the Lord Jesus, our God and Father, brought back from the dead our great shepherd of the sheep. Let us praise him. Let's listen to his voice this week. Not follow after the strangers. Let's be like New Zealand sheep that listen to their shepherd let's be like that let's pray Lord we thank you that you have revealed your voice to us you have spoken to us and given us eternal life and we're so grateful for that we're grateful for the abundant life that yes starts now in this life but will be an eternal life in the future and so this morning we remember our great shepherd the one who gave his life for us father help us to follow your voice help us to listen to him this week and as we remember him the one who not only died for us but who rose from death lord help us in this path we pray help us to listen to your voice in jesus name I know about sheep because my <clears throat> my granny used to take me every year to Scotland and they were old fashioned sheep. And the shepherd knew every one of them. He could recognize them. Could you recognize sheep? They all look the same. But when I used to go out with the, the guy and I remember once he got the flock to get, he saw there's a lame sheep across there and there was just this mob of sheep and he just pushed his way through and he got the sheep he wanted. How he recognised it, I had no idea, because it weren't for me. And he brought it out, whipped it over, and took it and stoned it and jammed it. He knew a sheep. He knew my name. And the, the verses that were coming to me is, they're in my sheep, they're in my hand, in my father's hand, and they'll never perish. Now, there was a 15-year period in my life when I, I wandered totally away. I was an atheist. My wife couldn't believe it. She said, how can you who have taught me believe what you believe have gone away? But then she said, I, I talked to her afterwards because obviously I came back after 15 years. And uh, she said, I knew you would come back because you promised that my sheep would never perish, that he would hold them. So I came back after 15 years of wandering, and since then, I know that even in my wandering, in some way it was in the shepherd's hand and plan, because things that I learned, things that I did, have been of use ever since. Um, even within the last two days, something that I had learned, a skill I learned, was used, used to help another sheep. And I, I thought even this morning, 
I can't tell you anything about it, only Ross knows, that the skill I learned, I used two days ago, that I would not have learned in my one, if I hadn't wandered. So, you know, I be encouraged if you have people who are wandering, or be encouraged in your life. Whatever's happening to you, God is using it, you're his sheep. He's using it that he might use you. My sheep will never perish. He holds me. My Father holds me. Father, I thank you for, perhaps I haven't said it clearly, I thank you for the, the truth that you hold us securely in your hand. Father, that if we commit our lives to you, we trust in you, we hear your voice, no matter how dark, no matter how strange the path may be, you never let us go. You hold us in your hand. Father, I thank you that even in the last 48 hours, your demonstration that you were leading me all of the way. Father, continue your work in each one of us. Help us to trust you fully. Keep our feet from wandering. We thank you for our shepherd who gave himself for us. Amen.
So um, we're going to have communion now together. I'm just think I've been thinking, listening this morning to the different ones, how how the scripture repeats itself. And I've always thought John and Paul agree, which is actually a dumb thing to say because they weren't making it up. It was actually the Holy Spirit. But they do agree. And one of the things we read this morning in uh, chapter 2, sorry, verse 22 of chapter 10 was, it's not, it's verse 29. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. No one has been able to, no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If anyone is in Christ, what? A, a, new, a new creation. So this is what the meal is about. This is the cross. The cross is about Man, humanity, man, men and women are man in this sense. And um, when you cross over to a new humanity, there's no going back. You've crossed from death to life. And that's a wonderful truth and it's an important one to know. Otherwise, you're never sure and you're always working hard to make sure you're in, in the, through the gate. <laughs> but actually... If you're a new creation, there, there is no scripture that says you go back to being an old creation. You go back to death. So that's important. It's very uh, good to know. Tony found that out. So um, here we have uh, a meal in front of us, the bread and the wine, and, and it represents the cross, represents Christ and what he did. And the cross is the thing that divides humanity into the old and the new. The old humanity in Adam, sinful, proud, lost, hopeless, can never get to God. And there is the death of that man, the death of that collective man, that one uh, sinful humanity. And then we have Jesus, the last Adam, on the cross as that man and also called the second man the new humanity and this is the man that we have come into this is who we are the new creation so these are tremendous deep things represented by a very simple meal bread and and wine so uh, the message of the meal is quite simple the bread One man, one new man, one collective humanity, one type of man, the new man. One loaf, lots of bits, but we all are part of the same substance. That's pretty easy. Even a child can understand that. And that's the the loaf that we share together. And then there is the wine, which represents the blood of Christ shed Uh, For us, the remission of sins. It says in Hebrews 9.22, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But that's exactly what we have. The shedding of blood and forgiveness. So that is what, um, by faith, um, by the grace of God, puts us into Jesus' hand and puts us into the Father's hand, which is a very safe place to be. So I'll pray and we'll share this meal together. Thank you, Father God, for this remembrance of you that we've had today and um, in your word. And thank you for this remembrance now in this meal that we can share together. Thank you, Lord, for the incredible privilege of being in the shepherd's grip and in the, in the father's grip over the top of the shepherd's grip and uh, for the truth of that. So we want to eat this bread now in remembrance of you and drink this Uh, wine, proclaiming your death, Lord, until you come again. Amen.
Why don't I'll give thanks for the offering. And we'll close. Thank you, Father God, for your provision. And I pray, Lord, that the gifts given this week will be used in a good way in your kingdom, Lord Jesus, um, for your glory. In Jesus' name. And thank you for our time together this morning. And um, thank you for what we've been able to hear. And I pray, Lord, it will sit with us this week. And thank you for your spirit and um, bring to our hearts and bring to our mind the, the things that we need to know this week to please you. And uh, thank you for the fellowship we have together again. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, just a couple of things to, to, to say and on closing is that we've got the church address we're doing an update on the church address book, so if you want your name in it and it's not in it already, you need to find it. I think it's in a yellow folder somewhere. Right there next to Jeff on the table. So if, if, you, if your details have changed and you want them to be changed, then you're going to have to change them. Or if you're not in it, you need to put yourself in it. Or if you don't want to be in it, you need to put yourself out of it. So there it is. That covers all the options. Um, and the other thing is we have a tentative date for the AGM, which is the 8th of November. So if anyone's in charge of any groups, that's the, the date. So you need to write reports and do that sort of thing. So I think that's the date, 8th of November. And Roland, the other one. You'll be all rolling out this morning. But it's great. Uh, we've heard a lot about hearing God's voice. And here's an opportunity. Maybe God is speaking to you in this. I had a request come through from Beth. Beth manages the Servants Health Centre. And um, there's a gentleman who's an elderly gentleman. He walks with a cane. He's a believer. But I'll just uh, read to you um, Beth's um, email. Not a very long one. I'm wondering if anyone at Cornerstone would be interested in a volunteer opportunity. We have a patient who uses a cane and has trouble walking. <coughs> this patient is looking for help with transport after his weekly grocery, grocery shopping. Every Monday he picks up his food vouchers and then goes to Centre City countdown to shop but has trouble getting back home with his grocery bags and his cane and is looking for someone to take him home and possibly even shop with him. The patient is very gentle man. He's also a believer. If anyone is interested, are you hearing God's voice? God sometimes calls people to do big things, but sometimes also he calls us to do small things. And this is something that maybe God is speaking to you about to help this elderly man get his groceries home. It happens around about 11ish, Beth, is that right? So, but if there's any change to that, we'll let you know. But please, listen, pray about this. Somebody needs some help, pray about it, and maybe God is speaking to you, or to me. Let's, let's leave it there. Thanks. Okay, so, go in peace. There's a cup of tea happening, I think, up the back. Have a good week, everyone. <laughs>